Well, I do count it a high privilege to be uh, preaching to you this morning, although I do have to admit I am a little offended by that last verse. <clears throat> I've always sang the country version, and I never thought it was that bad, but I never heard the Mexican version before, because I have eaten a cheesy taco. Amen. And I've worn a sombrero, and I've taken a trip to Mexico. All right, we're going to be in Second Chronicles uh, this morning. Second Chronicles chapter number 10. You said what time? Second Chronicles chapter number 10. Uh, we'll read the first 13 verses together, and uh, I'll give you a little bit of background really quick, and then I'll give you the thought that I have. Uh, on my heart this morning. Second Chronicles chapter number 10. The Bible says in verse number 1, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for to Shechem were all Israel come to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt, whither he had fled from the presence of Solomon the king, heard it that Jeroboam returned out of Egypt. So we've got Rehoboam in verse number 1 and Jeroboam in verse number 2. And they sent and called him. So Jeroboam and all Israel came and spake to Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Come again unto me after three days. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, saying, what counsel give ye me to return answer to this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind to this people, and please them, and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel which the old men gave him, and took counsel with the young men that were, notice this phrase, brought up with him, that stood before him. And he said unto them, What advice Give ye that we may return answer to this people, which have spoken to me, saying, E somewhat the yoke that thy father did put upon us. And the young men that were brought up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou answer the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it somewhat lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. For whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more to your yoke. My father chastened, chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king bade, saying, Come again to me on the third day. And the king answered them roughly, and the king Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men and answered them after the advice of the young men saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add thereto. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Lord, please, I pray, forgive me of my sins. Purify my heart. Touch my tongue and my lips this morning. I realize the great responsibility that I have to stand before your people. Lord, under the sound of my voice are those that have put their faith and trust in you. And Lord, there's more than likely one that hasn't put their faith and trust in you. There's no doubt, Lord, some that are uh, in that stage where they're making up their minds. They are leaning more towards God. They are seeking after you. Lord, without a doubt, there are some under the sound of my voice that are leaning more towards the world that can't wait for the first opportunity to get out from this place. I pray this morning you speak to our hearts, that you would have your will and way and all that said, please guide my tongue May I only say that which you have, have me to say and not what I want to say, but only what would help these young adults, I pray. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. Amen and amen. I'm not going to take a lot of time, but I want you to notice something very interesting about this passage. The Bible is very condensed. We have a very condensed book, so only 66 books. Uh, so when anything that's in this book is very important. If it's in here twice, it's extremely important. 
when you're studying the Gospels, you've got four Gospels, and they all tell different versions of the same story. Not all of them tell the same stories. But when there is a story that's in all four Gospels, pay attention. This passage happens twice in your King James Bible. In 1 Kings chapter number 12, the exact story is laid out, and then it's again repeated in Chronicles. So we have a story that's laid out for us in exact detail two times in our very condensed Bible. So it's very important. It's very worth looking at and looking into. If I was going to title my thought this morning, I'm going to call it this. Lessons from the Boehm boys. Lessons from the Boehm boys. We have two fellas. One's name is Jeroboam and one's name is Rehoboam. Rehoboam is Solomon's son and will become the king of all of Israel. Jeroboam is this fellow who was out uh, hiding away from Solomon and has come back now that he hears that Solomon has died and that Rehoboam will be the king. Jeroboam comes back. So here we find ourselves in the passage. Let me give you just a very quick background so you'll understand what's going on. There is a promise that was made to King David. Way back in 1 Kings chapter number 2, God told David, who was a man after God's own heart, he told David, he said, David, as long as you and all of your children follow after me, as long as you do right in the sight of the Lord, there'll always be a son to sit upon the throne. As long as you and your family and your children always do right by me, I will do right by you. But on the, on the very flip side, he said, if your children go away from me, then there will be trouble. Well, there was a promise made to King David that there would always be a man to sit upon the throne of Israel. Where we are in our passage with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, Rehoboam doesn't realize, but the decisions that he makes are going to split Israel forever. In fact, after Rehoboam makes this decision, there's going to be a 78-year war between Judah and Israel. The decisions that Rehoboam makes costs a lot of lives, a lot of heartache, and a lot of trouble. So lessons from these Boam boys. There was a promise made to King David, but there's a punishment for departing. In 1 Kings chapter number 11, God tells them that if, if they go away from God, if they do that which is wicked in the sight of the Lord, there will be punishment. Now, if you've studied your Bible at all, here's what you'll find. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. People came from miles around. The queen of Sheba traveled many distances to hear this wisdom that Solomon had. But because of his wisdom, God gave him power. God gave him riches. God gave him glory. God gave him anything that he wanted. Because he had all of this wisdom and power and riches, as he got older, he forsook the promises of his father David. As he got older, he didn't withhold anything from him. Any pleasure that he wanted, he indulged himself. Anything that his mind thought, he chased after it. Anything that was available, he got it. He bought it. He went after it. And in his older age, he went away from God. Even though he was the wisest man that ever lived... In his old age, in his older uh, age, he went away from the promises that his father had taught him. And so God decides to judge Israel. And God tells Jeroboam, this is where Jeroboam comes in. God tells Jeroboam, Jeroboam, I'm going to make you king over Israel. Now I'll keep my promise to David and Solomon will remain and his lineage will remain king over Judah. But we're going to split the kingdom in two. There's 12 tribes. Two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, will be on one side, reigned by David, and the rest of the tribes will be under Jeroboam. So God tells Jeroboam this, and Solomon hears of this, and instead of getting right, Solomon decides, I'm going to kill Jeroboam and take care of the problem. So Jeroboam flees to Egypt. He runs from Egypt while Solomon's alive. Solomon dies. Now Jeroboam wants to come home, and so he calls Rehoboam and says, can I come back, ease the burden that your dad put on me, and I will serve you forever. The reason why Jeroboam ends up in Egypt and the reason why this situation is the way it is is because Solomon forsook the promise that his father made. Solomon forsook the promise that he made when he asked God for wisdom to lead his people. 
And so we find that there is a promise to King David. We find that there is a punishment for departing. But here in our passage, we find a problem that derails the entire nation. I love talking to young adults and young uh, in, in your, your age group because I want you to understand something. The decisions that you make in the next few years will shape the rest of your life. I've made decisions in my youth that I've never, I'll never get away from. I'll never be able to undo. But you're in the point of your life where the decisions you make, who you decide to like, who you decide to marry, what you do and how you pay attention in school, what path you take next, they will shape the rest of your life. We find this boy and boy here is in a situation and he makes a decision. He makes a rash decision that not only costs him, but it costs Israel and it costs many, many lives and many, many heartaches. I like to tell this story. I don't know if you can still see it. It's kind of going away. But I have this ugly looking scar right here on my finger. Can you see it? I've got, it's like, it's like a centipede scar on my finger. And every time I shake somebody's hand, every time I grab a pen to write, every time I point, I'm reminded of a stupid mistake that I made. I was newly married and we uh, bought a Christmas tree and we were going to put our Christmas tree up, but we bought the stand and the stand was too small for the tree limb. So, or the, the trunk. So I was going to trim that trunk down to fit inside my tree stand. I'd like to tell you that I got it in a bar fight, but that's not how it happened. I was trying to trim the trunk on a Christmas tree to fit inside the Christmas tree stand. I'm right-handed, and so I'm trying to figure out how to take my kitchen knife to trim my tree trunk to fit inside this little stand. So I take the tree trunk with this hand and I take the knife in this hand and I trim the trunk, pop, and my finger splits open. I can see all the way down to the bone, blood's gushing out. I pinch my finger and I tell my wife, you gotta take me to the hospital. And I would love to tell you that that's the stupid part. That's not the stupid part. So we get to the hospital. I get to the surgeon. He sews it up and he stitches it up and he puts me in a splint. Right? That's a little metal thing that's wrapped with gauze. And he tells me, don't take the splint off. He said, I know what you're going to think. You're going to think that you're smart enough to keep your finger straight if you take the splint off. You're going to want to take a shower. You're going to want to wash your hands. Take a bag, put it over your wrist, and take your shower. Don't take the splint off. If you take the splint off, you're going to pull your finger. You're going to stretch your stitches, and you're going to end up with a centipede scar. That's not the dumb part. I wish that was the dumb part. I took, my, I took my splint off. I took a shower. 10 seconds, 10 seconds, I go to turn the water on and I bend my finger. And as soon as I do, I see the stitches stretch. I see it open up and I see this scar develop. It doesn't bleed. So I just kind of pinch it together and I try to pull the knot of the stitch to try to tighten it back up. Here's the dumb part. I could have gone back to the doctor and told him, you're right, I'm wrong, you're smart, I'm dumb. Can you fix this so I don't have a scar? But my pride wouldn't let me. And now I have a reminder every day of my life of not just one, not just two, but three stupid decisions that left me with an everlasting as long as I'm alive, Scar, that I'm reminded every single time I grab a pen, every single time I shake somebody's hand, every single time I point, and I'm telling you, the decisions that you make in the next few months and the next few years can leave you with scars that will never go away. Lessons from the Bowen boys. So we find that there's a promise to King David. We find that there is a punishment for departing, but we find that there is a problem that derails here. Here we have Rehoboam. Rehoboam is the son of Solomon. He is the grandson 
of King David, two of the greatest kings that have ever lived in the nation of Israel. In fact, today, the nation of Israel flies the flag that still holds the star of David. Jerusalem is still considered the capital of, uh, of, 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 of Israel, the nation of Israel. I know they have Tel Aviv and all of that. That's a whole little other political argument. But they, they, David and Solomon are still the greatest kings that ever lived in the nation of Israel. We're talking about the grandson of King David, the son of King Solomon. David is known as the most spiritual man that ever lived. Nobody else in the Bible, God calls David twice a man after my own heart. So Rehoboam's grandfather was the most spiritual man. He was a man after God's own heart. His father was Solomon, which is the wisest man that ever lived, right? So he's got his father's wisdom. He's got his grandfather's spirituality. Yet he finds himself in a situation that derails, that changes the course of Israel. The decision that he makes causes so much heartache and so much problem for so many people. Here's the, the situation I want you to understand. That he makes this decision... In spite of his parents' crown. It does not matter who your parents are. It does not matter who your grandparents are. Here we find a man who his dad was Solomon and his grandpa was King David. And yet he makes a decision that costs so much heartache. It doesn't matter what school you go to. It doesn't matter what church you belong to. It doesn't matter who your pastor is. It doesn't matter who, who your mom or your dad is or how spiritual they are. You will make decisions that affect you. You will do things that will affect you. You will be presented with situations, and if you make the wrong decision, you will be affected. Doesn't matter how, how wonderful your mom is. Doesn't matter how much your dad prays. Doesn't matter how much money they give to the church. We find here that he makes these mistakes in spite of his parents' crown. The son of the wisest king. The grandson of the most spiritual king. And it never ceases to amaze me that those who have seen God firsthand always seem to be the ones that mess up the most. I mean, if we go back to the Bible, we look at God, when God made Adam. The Bible says he took the dust of the earth and he formed it into a man and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He created man from dust. That's Adam. Then he gives him a wife. And they have two sons, Cain and Abel. We're talking about Cain's dad walked literally with God, was created by the hands of God, had God's breath in him. Yet he gets mad and kills his brother. You fast forward a little bit further and you find that uh, Abraham, who, is, who, who walks with God and, and loves God and serves God, he has a, a nephew named Lot. And, and Lot's blessed by Abraham and Lot's blessed by God for being with Abraham. But they decide to go their separate ways and Lot takes his family into Sodom. They go into Sodom and God, you know the story, God rescues Lot and his wife and his two daughters out of Sodom. And he says, I'm going to destroy Sodom with fire and with brimstone. He brings them out of Sodom. Their mother turns back and turns into a pillar of salt. Their brothers and sisters stay in Sodom and fire and brimstone falls and destroys the city. They wake up the next morning, they can literally smell the fire and the brimstone. They can see the punishment of God. Yet they get their father drunk and commit incest. First hand witnessing God's power. Noah's sons are with him when they build the ark in the middle of nowhere. For, for years, Noah's out there preaching, saying it's going to come rain. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. Noah's preaching faithfully. There's judgment coming. There's judgment coming. And his family listen to him and help him build this ark. They watch as God brings this crazy animals two by two from all over the world. They bring these animals to the ark. They all get on this ark. God shuts the door and it begins to rain. And for 365 days, they're in in the ark. They hear as people are pounding on the side when the rain starts to fall. Noah, Noah, let us in, Noah. We believe you now, Noah. Holding their babies up as the water begins to rise. They're inside the ark listening. They can see the judgment of God firsthand. 365 days later, they're let out of the ark. The earth is completely redone and there's not a living person or creature except what comes out of the ark. They saw God's judgment. 
firsthand. Three days later, Ham gets his father drunk and commits a homosexual act. It amazes me that people who have great parents, people who have great grandparents, people who love God and serve God, how, how, many, how many pastor's kids, how many preacher's kids who their father preached and many people got saved, their fathers preached and many people got help, but their own family who saw the blessings of God and saw the judgment of God and were firsthand witnesses to God doing things in their life, they're the ones who make stupid decisions that cost not just them but everybody. It doesn't matter what your parents, it doesn't matter who your parent is, it doesn't matter who your grandparent is, it doesn't matter, it does not matter what your lineage is. If you don't make the right decisions, you will pay the price. You make a stupid decision, you get stupid rewards. I see that he makes this, this problem that derails, it, it happens in spite of his parents' crown. Notice in verse number six. <clears throat> of chapter 10. When he is first confronted by Jeroboam coming back, when he's first confronted by Jeroboam, he decides in verse number 6, and Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give ye me to return to this people? So his first decision was a good one. He tells them, give me three days to give you an answer. Can I just take a time out real quick and tell you, don't make rash decisions. The, the salesman wants to sell you that car, wants to sell you that item. They want to sell you right there. Make the decision on the spot. Come on. If you don't buy it now, it's going to be gone. You've got to get it now. But his wise part, the first thing he does was wise. He must have learned from his, fa his, his father was give me three days and let me think about it. Then the Bible says he goes and he seeks the counsel of the old men. He goes to those men which stood before his father Solomon. These men have been around. Not only do they have experience because they've been around. They, they were there when Solomon was king. But they also watched the wisdom of Solomon. They also saw Solomon make good decisions, and they also saw Solomon make bad decisions. They were around to watch the rise and the power of Solomon, and they were around to watch the demise and the fall of Solomon. So he goes and he seeks the counsel of the old men, and they tell him, if you speak peaceably to these people, they'll be your servants forever. Don't miss this. Listen, don't miss this. Jeroboam was promised to be the king of Israel. That's what God told him because Solomon rebelled. Jeroboam comes back and says, look, if you'll just make this right, I don't want to be king. I don't want any trouble. I'll be your servant. Instead of me trying to take something from you, I will be your servant. So Rehoboam goes and asks the wise counsel of the old man, and the Bible very clearly tells us he forsook the counsel of the old man. So this problem that derailed, it happened in spite of his parents' crown. But it also happened in spite of past counselors. So not only does it matter, it doesn't matter who your dad is or your mom is. It doesn't matter who your grandpa or your grandpa was. It also doesn't matter who your pastor is. It doesn't matter what advice you have gotten in the past you can still make the decision for yourself. I remember when I first took over Shepherd Baptist Church, I was underneath Brother Nelson Osborne. I got to spend four years under this old man, old army vet. Got shot three times. He got shot three times and then drove himself to the, I'm talking about a tough bird, drove himself to the hospital. I got to spend four years underneath him in some of the most invaluable time in my life. When I went to Shepherd Baptist Church, I thought, man, they picked the right guy. They don't even know what's going to hit Mooresville when I show up. Boy, I got style, pizzazz. I got experience. I'm going to blow there. I did not know how much I needed to be under Nelson Osborne for four years. One of the things he told me that I will never forget is he said, Preacher Mike, it doesn't matter how much you preach. People are going to do what people want to do. You can preach and preach and preach. You can tell them story after story after story. You can they can see in their own church 
People who used to live for God. People who used to love God. Who made poor decisions and their life's a wreck and a ruin. Some of them have drug addicts in their own family. Some of them have drunks in their own family. Some of them have people who are outside of the will of God in their own family. And it doesn't matter. Even if they have first-hand knowledge, they're still going to do what they want to do. So here we have this guy making a decision in spite of his parents' crown. He makes this decision in spite of his past counsel. He goes to the old men. He goes to those men who have experience and knowledge and wisdom. And many of you have sat under your preacher and heard him preach and give you uh, the, the points and, and give you uh, messages and ideas and stories and give you illustrations. But at the end of the day, you're going to do what you want. Mom's not always going to be around. Dad's not always watching. The preacher is not always going to be there. There's going to be times when it's just you. And you're going to have to decide what you're going to do. Talk about lessons from the Bowen boys. In spite of his parents' crown, in spite of the past counsel, in spite of the experienced, aged wisdom and the watching of these men... He decides to take counsel with his friends. So I find the parent's crown. I find the past counsel. But I want you to notice the peers, his peers' callousness. His peers' callousness. Here's what his peers say. Now, the Bible says he went to go talk to the old men who were around when his, fathers were around, when his father was around. They said... Speak peaceably, be nice, be kind to these people and they'll serve you. You'll have a friend for life. Treat this guy right and he will be your friend for life. He goes to his friends that grew up with him and he says, what should I do? And they say, let's be cruel. Let's be harsh. Let's tell them you think my dad was bad. Baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. I am amazed at how calloused and how cold and how cold hearted of a generation that we live in nowadays. I am amazed at what people put on Facebook and what people send in text messages. I'm amazed at the rate of bullying that happens nowadays. I'm, I'm amazed at how we're so quick to cut each other, so quick to attack one another. We live in a very cynical and calloused age. Y'all are growing up in a day when teens would just as soon cut their friends as they would cut their enemies yeah. this these people that he grew up with they were callous they were cold-hearted they don't even know the story they don't even know why Jeroboam went now the old men know the old men know why Jeroboam went and, and went to Egypt and the old men understand that by Jeroboam coming back it really means something significant yeah. but his friends don't know they grew up with him why go ask another retard a question. They weren't any smarter than him. They weren't any, yeah, I said that word because I wanted to see if he was paying attention. They weren't any smarter than him. They had any more, no more wisdom than he, than he did. And yet it, that's exactly what you do. You don't go and talk to the pastor. You don't want to know because you know what the pastor is going to tell you. You don't go ask your mom because you know what your mom's going to tell you. You don't go ask your dad because you know what your dad's going to tell you. You don't go ask the Sunday school teacher. You know what the Sunday school teacher is going to tell you. So instead you get on Facebook or you get on Snapchat or whatever it is that y'all use nowadays and you talk to somebody that's just like you who thinks just like you and is going to give you the answer that you want to hear. And nine times out of ten it's cold, it's calculated, it's calloused and and you cut each other down and you knock on each other. In fact, you, in order to be cool nowadays, you have to have a quick wit. In order to be cool, you have to be able to cut and cut right back. Somebody says something, you need to snap right back at them. Boy, you need to be able to talk right back. Think fast. Think fast. That's the only way to make it in this day because everybody is so harsh and cold and calloused. We live in a generation, uh, the Bible tells us in, in the book of Proverbs, it says that there's a generation that curses their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet are not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh how lofty are their eyes and their eyes are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords 
and their, and their jawbone like knives to devour the poor from off the earth. The Bible says that there's going to come a generation that their teeth are like knives. All they ever do is spit out ugly things about everybody. Yes. You know, you got some right here in school. All they ever do is talk bad about everybody. I remember when I first met my wife. It was in a Christian school just like this. And she always kept to herself. And I would ask her, why don't you hang out with all the other girls? And this is what she said when she was just a teenager. She said, I've realized that if they're going to talk to me bad about other people, they're going to talk to other people bad about me. Honey, you better pay attention. If they're telling you garbage about everybody else, I promise you they're telling everybody else garbage about you. If they're telling you stuff about him, then I promise you they're telling him stuff about you. There's a generation their peers were calloused. This is what they said. They, they don't even know the situation. They don't know that what God is trying to do. They don't even understand what God is trying to work out. All they know is we have an opportunity to put our foot. We have our opportunity to put salt in the wound. We have an opportunity to cut these people down. Let's tell them your father chasing you with whips. I'm going to chasing you with scorpions. I'm going to take it to the next level. This problem that derails all of Israel happens because he doesn't listen to the old men. He doesn't listen, lean on his parents' crown, but he listens to the callousness of his peers. They didn't even know why Jeroboam fled to Egypt. They didn't even realize that Solomon left the promise of God. They didn't realize that God was about to punish uh, Solomon and punish Israel for going away from God. They didn't even know. All they know is they're quick to slander. They're quick to hurt. They're quick to cut. They're quick to speak. There's a generation. Their teeth are like swords. Seems like. Only thing anybody ever says now is negative. When's the last time you said something positive to one of your friends? When's the last time you complimented one of your friends? When's the last time you said something nice? Or is it when we drive down the road and you see somebody on the side of the road, the, the funny thing is to make fun of them to whoever's in the car with you. Oh, look at them. That's exactly how our minds are. This is the people he decides to take counsel from? Are these the people that you're going to ask the questions of? Hey, let me give you some advice, okay? Don't cut a tree with a kitchen knife. That's good advice. Do you know how I know? Because I did it. Be smart. There's a lot smarter ways to trim the Christmas tree trunk. I've been there. But if you ask one of your buddies, they'd probably say, that's a great idea. Let's cut it. The problem that derails all of Israel happens in spite of their parents' crown, happens in spite of past counsel. It happens because of their peers' callousness. You could have the best parents, you could have the best pastor, but if you got poor friends, you're gonna be in trouble. You could have the best parents, you could have the best pastor, but if you pick poor friends, you're going to end up in a mess. Be careful who you hang out with. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful whose advice that you take. I see that there was a promise to the king. There was a punishment of departing. There was a problem that derailed. The problem was that he made a decision in spite of his parents' counsel. He made a decision in spite of the past, I mean, his parents' crown, in spite of the past counsel. And he made a decision based on his peers' callousness be careful who you hang out with you can see it in their eyes see I've been pastoring a while now and I like to make it a habit to look into people's eyes and I got people at my church they tell me don't look at me preacher I feel like you're looking into my soul I'm trying to because your eyes say a lot about you what kind of a person you are, how you respond, 
whether you respond well to criticism, whether you respond well to a parent's judgment, whether you respond well to the preaching. When I preach, I used to, when I was a young preacher, I used to tell them that I look at their foreheads so that they think I'm looking at them, but I didn't want to see them looking at me because I don't want to see people fall asleep. But now that I'm an older preacher, I like looking in people's eyes. I like, I like it when it gets awkward. My, my daughter says I'm the king of awkward. I like to see how people react. Sometimes I'll say things and I'll do things just to see what you're going to do. You can see it in their eyes. Be careful who you hang out with. I, 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 was, a, I, was, I was a pastor of, the, of this young boy. And he was a handsome boy. I mean, handsome boy. Dimples. He had charisma. He had, he, everybody liked him. Everybody hung out with him. Everywhere he went, everybody wanted to be around him. Then I found out who his grandpa was. When I found out who his grandpa was, I was like, man, do you realize the blood that runs through your vein? Your grandpa stood and many, many, many people got saved. You've got rich heritage. Not only do you have a rich heritage, you have a bright future. You're smart. You're handsome. You're good looking. You're charismatic. People love you. You've got a possibility to do something for God. And I took many years and I poured it into this kid and I took him to teen camp and I took him to places and I took him to meetings with me and I preached to him and I spent time with him. I put money out of my own pocket and I bought him clothes and I bought him things because I knew God can do great things with this kid and I told him all the time don't you realize what God can do with you with the, the crown that your father has given you and the pastor that God's put in your life who is trying to invest in you don't you see what God can do but he had some friends So he jumps in the car with some of his buddies. They don't know, he don't know where they're going. There's kids in the car he don't even know. They decide to pull up to a house because the driver has a beef with somebody in the house. They all jump off. He don't even know what's going on. They break into the house and they beat up a handicapped kid. While they're in there, they decide to go ahead and steal some stuff. So he takes a gun and he shoots the roof with an AK-47. They get back in their car, make it two blocks, and they get caught by the police. Now this boy is sitting behind a plexiglass wall. And I get a phone call from his grandma begging me to go see him. So I put on my suit and tie, and I drive down to the county jail, showing my badge and all my information. And here comes this good-looking boy, full of potential, full of possibility, full of character and charisma, great parents, great pastor, and handcuffs. For the next five months, I visit him, and every time I see him, he looks worse and worse. His face is hardened. He's got bruises where they beat him up. By the time I visit him, the last available visit, he, they, he's, already got they, he's already got a tattoo. He's got scars. His hair has grown out. His eyes have grown wild, and I would not have recognized him if I saw him on the street. Such possibility, such potential, such great situation to be in. But he was in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong friends. Do you know what he went down for? He went down for attempted murder. And I mean, there was a whole host of things, but they also put charges on him for beating up a handicapped kid, even though he didn't hit the kid once. And according to him, he didn't shoot the kid. He shot in the air, but he admitted to firing the weapon. So they, they threw the maximum charges on him. And now this once good-looking grandson of a great preacher is sitting behind bars right now. Be careful 
who friends, what friends you hang out with. See, it's just one decision. It's just one chance. It's just one opportunity. It's just one thing that you make, one, one move that you make, and you could affect the rest of the situation. You could affect the rest of the air. Be careful who you are friends with. But that's not the end of the story. There is a promise to the king, and I have to hurry. There is a punishment for departing. There is a problem that derails. There, even though he had good parents, he had past the parents' crown. He had the past counsel. His peers were callous. He made this decision. But I want you to notice that even in this passage, there's still a planned deliverance. This is not the end of the story. And you can read, and it, it's really a crazy story, all that happens. If you go back to Kings and you go into Chronicles, I, I, I mean, there's all kind of crazy stuff. A preacher ends up getting killed by a lion because he disobeys God. I mean, it's, it's, this story is wild. But there is a planned deliverance. God does two things in this passage that shows us that even in the midst of our worst decisions, there's still a chance for redemption. The first of these is that there is a path to restoration. Again, I've already told you several times that Jeroboam flees to Egypt. He runs from Solomon because God told him he was going to make him king. Solomon decides, I'm going to kill this guy and keep my kingdom. Solomon dies and Jeroboam decides to come back and make restitution. Realize this. God sends Jeroboam back. Here's the deal. God already told Jeroboam, you're going to be king. But God would have honored Jeroboam if he came back and said, I, I, I want you to be kind to me. And Rehoboam would have treated him kindly. The Bible says he would have been his servant forever. God would have unwritten his already planned wrath on Israel. I, I know, there's a lot of words to say this. God was already about to send the punishment. But if he would have received Jeroboam back, God would not have punished. He would have forgiven. He would have let the nation of Israel stay whole. He would have honored his word. He would have honored his promise. Every time, every time there's heartache, every time there's judgment, every time there's a harsh preacher, every time you feel that butterflies, every time you hear the word of God, there's a chance, there's a chance, there's a path to redemption. You don't have to go all the way down the path to find out that it's terrible at the end. Anybody ever heard the phrase, you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet? That's not true. You can learn from somebody else's mistakes. Here in this situation, God's already passed judgment, but he would allow mercy. He would give a second chance. If Rehoboam would have listened to the counsel of the old men and spoke kindly to Jeroboam, God would have healed the entire nation of Israel. There's a chance. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. You don't have to hang out with a scornful kid. You don't have to hang out with a scorner. You don't hang, have to hang out with a negative guy. Blessed is the man that doesn't hang out with those kinds of people. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. It's very clear that if we follow what God wants, he will bless so we see that there is a path for restoration. But I want you to see this, and I'll be done. 2 Chronicles chapter number 11. 2 Chronicles chapter number 11. Now, I got this because I was just reading my Bible. I was in Chronicles when I was reading. In fact, I'll be honest with you. I read First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and I got bored. There was too many names and begats and, and this number and that number. So I skipped ahead, and I went and read Esther and Job and Psalms. Then I came back to read Chronicles. And when I got to this chapter, I realized I just read this in Kings. So I went back and looked at it in Kings. And then I was reading ahead and I saw something that popped out that blessed my heart. Let me share it with you. Second Chronicles chapter number 11. 
Rehoboam makes a bad decision, costs Israel 78 years of war. People die. It's all, it's, it's all jacked up. But look what happens. Chapter number 11, let's start in verse number 5. And Rehoboam, this is the king, dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities. He builds these cities for defense in Judah. Okay? He's paranoid. He thinks he's going to have to fight, which he's going to. So what he does is he builds cities of defense. What cities does he build? Verse number six, he built even Bethlehem and Edom and Tekoa and Bethzur and Shoko and Adullam and Gath and Marishah and Ziph and Adorium and Lachish and Ezekah and Zorah and Ahilajan, and Hebron, which are in Judah and in Benjamin, fenced cities. First time I read that, nothing popped out. Second time I read that, I saw where he says he built, don't miss this neat little, neat little word, even Bethlehem. Why did God put that little word even in there? Well, I don't know. What happens in Bethlehem? What happens in Luke chapter number two, when the Bible tells us that there was shepherds abiding in their field, right. keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring unto you good tidings of great joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill towards men. Listen what happened. Rehoboam makes a decision that causes problems and war in all of Israel. The nations are fighting against each other. But even in the midst of the mess, God allows Rehoboam to build the city that Jesus will be born in. There's still a path for redemption. There's still a path for deliverance. Even in the middle of a mistake, God always makes a way of escape. Can I say it again? Even in the middle of a mistake... God always makes a way of escape. Even though Rehoboam makes the wrong choice and costs him and costs Israel, God still uses Rehoboam to build the city that he will send his son through. Over in Micah, in chapter, uh, Micah chapter number five. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the nations, of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that shall be the ruler in all Israel, whose going forth hath been of old from everlasting to everlasting. Bethlehem, Euphrates, even though you're a little city, even though you were built in the time and by a king who made a great mistake and a bad choice that cost a lot of people, God still sent his son through the city of Bethlehem, through the throne of David. God still kept his promise to David in spite of his sons making bad choices. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. You have may, may have made some bad choices. You have may, may have hung out with some bad friends. But there's always hope. And if you're here today and you're breathing, there's a chance. There's a possibility that God can still do great things with you. And who knows? You can make a decision that might cost you, but you could also make a decision that will bless the entire world. On one hand, Rehoboam makes a decision that costs Israel 78 years of war. On the other hand, Rehoboam makes a decision that blessed the entire world and for generations to come. Out of the dark streets of Bethlehem, the Lord Jesus would be born. Lessons from the Bowen boys. Doesn't matter who your parents are. Doesn't matter who your preacher is. What really counts, who's your friends. And the decisions, decisions you make in the next few years will have a significant effect on the rest of your life. Don't cut Christmas trees with stick knives. Lord, we love you. 
We thank you for the opportunity to be here to speak to these young hearts. Lord, I pray my heart goes out. Lord, I think of my own teens at Shepherd. Lord, I pray for them and I worry about them. I see them going to work and going to school. Some of them getting into the college level. I see the influence of the world. Lord, I realize that these young people are bombarded by things that I don't even understand. They are constantly bombarded by social media and friends. They are, they are exposed to things I've never even seen just by the, the, the sheer fact that they have a cell phone in their hand. They are connected to people and situations. Their flesh, Lord, has been fed filth by this world. I pray, God, I pray, I beg you, I beseech you, Lord, be merciful to these young adults, to these young ones, Lord, these tender aged. I pray that you'd be merciful, that the words of the preacher that they hear Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday, the words of the preacher that they hear in chapel, the fact that they're in a Christian school and that their parents care enough to pay to send them to a place where they can be protected from the world's ideology and the world's thoughts and the, and the harshness of the wickedness of this world. Help them, protect them, bless them, give them direction and wisdom. I pray that you would protect them from decisions that would cost them and haunt them and hurt them. And then I do ask, even in the middle of whatever happens and whatever choices, you show us that way of escape, that path to deliverance that you always make available. And then let me close by saying thank you. Thank you for your mercies that fail not. They are new every single morning. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you for the times in my life where I thought I have wrecked it all and ruined it all. But by your grace and by your mercy, you helped me and saved me, not just from, from hell, but from my own stupidity time and time again. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.